Stay cool. This is a Thor News presentation. Hit the button, baby. Thor News presents. Seriously, bro. Papa's got a new bag of tricks. Now, this isn't doomy, but it's fascinating. And so I'm taking you on a journey with me. What is a planet? What is a dwarf planet? Dangling dingleberries. Now, how much do we really know about star creation, solar formation, and dark antimatter penetration? Okay, we were over at Universe today, and we were digging deep into one of my favorite subjects. Planet X light, if you will. We're talking about all those new planets they found way back in the day. Remember when Mike Brown and his scrappy crew found a whole bunch of new planets? And then the International Astronomical Union decided the best thing to do would be to demote Pluto. So people got so upset that they demoted Pluto, they went into a blind rage and started astronomer civil wars that were really bloody. I mean, I don't think that there had been that much blood on sweatpants since I don't even know how to end that joke analogy. Okay, yeah, so, and I was like, wow, dude, this stuff is fascinating. They found a bunch of new planets, like Sedna, Eris. And Eris was the planet that got Pluto demoted, you know? And I'm like, tell me more about all these brand new planets, or dwarf planets, if you will. So here we are talking about the possible dwarf planet 2007 OR10 by Matt Williams on September 2nd, 2015. And here again, we get into the NASA A. It's just another big, dumb, boring space rock. Even on this artist's conception, it looks just like Ceres, or like our moon, kind of. And in it, artists suspect that its rosy color is due to the presence of irradiated methane. Credit NASA. But if you'll notice, this picture is just gray and white. <laughs> so it's like, okay, yeah, it's kind of reddish, like Herculubus is rumored to be. But we're going to show it in gray, because we like to present people that everything is just a big... Gray, boring, stupid rock. Nothing to see here. Move along. It is interesting that they nicknamed it Snow White, which would mean that there were seven brown dwarfs looking nearby. I think we will have to ask Mike Brown that question. Though, I don't think he talks to little people much. Over the course of the past decade, more and more objects have been discovered within the trans-Neptunian region. With every new find, we have learned more about the history of our solar system and the mysteries it holds. At the same time, these finds have forced astronomers to re-examine astronomical conventions that have been in place for decades. Ain't it weird how science gravitates between science is never wrong and oops, we were totally wrong about that? But I guess it wasn't science that was wrong, it was the scientists. Kind of like when the Catholic Church had a Spanish Inquisition and they murdered 100,000 people in really grotesque ways. It wasn't the Catholic Church that did that. It was those Catholics. <laughs> right? See how that works? Alright. Consider 2007. OR10, a trans Neptunian object, TNO, located within the scattered disk that at one time went by the nickname of the Seventh Dwarf and Snow White. What? Approximately the same size as Haume, it is believed to be a dwarf planet, and currently the largest object in the solar system that does not have a name. Bad luck to have both without a name. I imagine it's bad luck to have a planet, dwarf planet, planetoid, without a name either. Here at Thor News, here's how I define if you're a planet or if you're not a planet. Do you have an aurora on top of you? Then you're a planet. If you do not, then you are not. It's pretty simple and super sciencey. Discovery and naming. 2007 OR10 was discovered by Meg Schwamb, a PhD candidate at Caltech and a graduate student of Michael Brown while working out of the Palomar Observatory. The object was colloquially referred to as the Seventh Dwarf from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Why, thanks, universe today. I had no idea. Since it was the seventh object to be discovered by Brown's team after Quaor in 2002, Sedna in 2003, Haume and Orcus in 2004, and Maki Maki and Eris in 2005. Well, thank God they demoted Pluto. At the time of discovery, the object appeared to be very large and very white, which led to Brown giving it the other nickname of Snow White. However, subsequent observation has revealed that the planet is actually one of the reddest in the Kuiper Belt. So of course NASA had him artistic render it as gray. It's so red it's comparable only to Haume. As a result, the nickname was dropped and the object is still designated at 2007 OR10. Yeah, because I guess snow red would sound weird. The discovery of 2007 OR10 would not be formally announced until January 7th, 2009. It, yeah, they do stuff like that. 
they discover stuff, and then they're like, hey, wait, how do we tell the people? When do we tell the people? A study published in 2011 by Brown, in collaboration with A.J. Burr Gasser and W.C. Frazier, 2007 OR10's diameter was estimated to be between 1,000 and 1,500 kilometers. These estimates were based on photometry data obtained in 2010 using the Magellan Bod Telescope at the Los Campos Observatory in Chile, and from the spectral data obtained by the Hubble Space Telescope. However, a survey conducted in 2012 by Pablo Santo Sanz et al. of the Trans-Neptunian region produced an estimate of more based on the object size, albedo, and thermal properties. Combined with its absolute magnitude and albedo, 2007 OR10 is the largest unnamed object and the fifth brightest TNO in the solar system. No estimates of its mass have been made as of yet. 2007 OR10 also has a highly eccentric orbit with an inclination of 30 point other numbers degrees. What this means is that at perihelion is roughly 33 astronomical units away from our sun when it's at aphelion it's as far away as 100 astronomical units. It takes about 546 years to orbit Earth, which means that the last time it was at perihelion was 1857. Now it won't reach aphelion until 2130. As such, it is currently the second farthest known large body in the solar system, and will be farther out than both Sedna and Eris by 2045. Composition According to the spectral data obtained by Brown, Burgasser, and Fraser, 2007 OR10 shows infrared signatures for both water ice and methane, which indicates that it is likely similar in composition to guawar. Concurrent with this, the reddish appearance of 2007 OR10 is believed to be due to presence of tholins in the surface ice, which are caused by the irradiation of methane by ultraviolet radiation. Also, the presence of water ice on the surface is believed to imply that the object underwent a brief period of cryovolcanism in its distant past. According to Brown, who really knows it all, this period would have been responsible for not only water ice freezing on the surface, but for the creation of an atmosphere that included nitrogen and carbon monoxide. They would have depleted rather quickly though, and a tenuous atmosphere of methane would be all that remains today. However, more data is required before astronomers can say for sure whether or not 2007 OR10 has an atmosphere, a history of cryovolcanism, and what its interior looks like. Like other KBOs, like other KBOs, it is possible that it is differentiated between a mantle of ices and a rocky core. Assuming that there is sufficient antifreeze, or due to the decay of radioactive elements, there may even be a liquid water ocean at the core mantle boundary. Well, that story's kind of boring. See if I can spice it up. Classification. Though it is too difficult to resolve 2007 OR10's size based on direct observation, based on calculations of 2007 OR10's albedo and absolute magnitude, many astronomers believe it to be of sufficient size to have achieved hydrostatic equilibrium. As Brown stated in 2011, 2007 OR10 must be a dwarf planet, even if predominantly rocky, which is based on a minimum possible diameter of 552 kilometers and what is believed to be the conditions under which hydrostatic equilibrium occurs in cold icy rock bodies. And so the reason I want to do this story is because they have to name this thing. And Mike Brown seems to know hurry to name it. And if he doesn't name it, the IAU is going to name it eventually. And so if you take the one from the OR10 and turn it down on horizontal and put it next to the seven, it makes Zorro. So what I'm saying here is this dwarf planet planetoid, I think we should name it Zorro. It's way cooler than Snow White. Or snow red. Currently, nothing is known of 2007 OR10's mass, which is a major factor when determining if a body has achieved hydrostatic equilibrium. This is due in part to there being no known satellites in orbit of the object, which in turn is a factor in determining the mass of a system. Meanwhile, the IAU has not addressed the possibility of accepting additional dwarf planets since before the discovery of 2007 OR10 was announced. However, if all goes well, this potential dwarf planet could be joining the ranks of such bodies as Pluto, Eris, Ceres, Haume, Megmeg, in the not too distant future. And with luck, it will be given a name that actually sticks. Alright, there you go. You learn more about the other planets in our solar system. Sorry, this one was a little boring, but I wanted to name it Zorro. So let's name this planet Zorro. Go ahead and Twitter tweet Mike Brown. Say, hey dude, name that planet Zorro. Okay, thanks. Peace out.